Hello everyone, my name is Foibles, and today I'd like to talk to you about the Materium Tomes in Age of Wonders 4. Let's go over them in detail and talk about any potential synergies. So let's get started with the Tome of Rock. First of all, the hero skill, Obsidian Weaponry, is pretty weak. 60% chance of inflicting bleeding, which is probably the worst damage over time we have access to. Uh, physical damage is very easily resisted by lots of enemies, and defense only stacks higher as you get later into the game. The central quarry, however, is fantastic. This is a huge amount of production for such a cheap and early province improvement, and you're going to want lots of quarries in your cities already, so being able to stack that production bonus sky high really means you can build up your cities very, very quickly. You're going to want one of these in basically every city you have. We have a real mixed bag of spells. Rock Blast is a cheap damage spell. It only costs 10 mana, and 30 is respectable damage. But physical damage is very easily resisted. If you are going to use this, you're probably going to want to have to soften the enemy up first with some sundered defenses. Stone Skin is a very weird defensive spell. For 15 mana, you get 3 defense and 3 resistance on a single target. A lot less useful against spirit damage, obviously. If you had no defense at all, 3 defense is almost 30%. But, of course, there's diminishing returns the more defense you have. Is that going to be worth it? It depends. If you really need to protect a unit, and you think it's worth the 15 mana, go ahead. But usually I think you have better uses of your limited casting options. Earthkin is your minor race transformation, and as early minor race transformations go, it is a pretty good one. Plus one defense is universally useful. You also get access to Rock Walk, which makes you move faster over rocky terrain. Rocky terrain is pretty much everywhere, so the movement speed buff is very, very handy. Rock camouflage, however, giving your units camouflage on rocky terrain, that's less useful, especially against the AI. Uh, camouflage is currently very inconsistent against the AI, even assuming it if it works at all. We'll just have to ha see how that develops with Triumph's changes to the AI that they're going to release in the summer update. Hopefully there's some improvements there. The Tome also gives us access to two units, and first of all we have the Gargoyle. This is a fantastic shock unit. It's also easy to build because it requires 50 gold and 50 mana, which can be very helpful if gold is tight, which it will be in the early game. Shock units are rare, especially early shock units, and the Gargoyle is not just a shock unit, it also flies, helping it charge into enemy back lines, skipping their shield units and going straight into their archers. Its defense mode heals itself and gives it a free stone skin for the cost of taking away its retaliation attack. If you want this thing to retaliate, you need to attack with it. But overall, the Gargoyle is a great investment for any culture that doesn't have access to a shock unit. Even later in the game, Gargoyles can stay very relevant. The Lesser Stone Spirit, which you can summon with a spell. This one is a fighter unit, which is not wonderful, and as units go, it's probably the weakest of all of the summonable spirits. It claims, the spell claims it has good defenses, but 2 and 1, that's nothing fantastic, and with 60 hit points, it dies very easily. This thing will eventually evolve into a fully grown stone spirit, which we'll talk about later, but you can summon a fully grown stone spirit with the Terramancy Tome, so this one might not be worth it. If you are going into a build, however, that makes use of lots of evolutions, it might be worth looking into. Next up, let's have a look at the Tome of Enchantment. Now this is a really easy to recommend early game tome that comes with a lot of fantastic enchantments. 
One of the selling points is Sundering Blades grants all melee attacks a chance to sunder defense, which not only sunders the enemy defense, it also sunders status resistance, which is very nice. This is also available as a hero skill, but for whatever reason, the hero skill has a 60% chance of inflicting it, whereas Sundering Blades gives a 90% chance, so your heroes are a lot less reliable for doing this. The trade-off is that heroes get access to this on their physical ranged attacks, so if you have an archer hero especially, this can be worthwhile for sundering enemy defenses at range. The Rune Carver's Camp, your province improvement, is absolutely fantastic. Draft, especially early on in the game, is very important, and 15 is a lot of draft. This also counts as a quarry, as well as giving you mana for adjacent quarries, and you're bound to want lots of quarries in pretty much any city. This is also cheap, and even better early on, but maintains relevance even into the late game. Your other unit enchantments include Seeker Arrows, which is one of the best archer enchantments in the game, probably only competing with Amplified Arrows from the Astral Tomes, but giving physical ranged attacks of your archers plus one range, there is very little better than that. Being able to shoot from further means you'll often get more attacks off, which means your archers will do more damage. It's just a great buff to have, and it comes very early. Spell Tempered Shields rounds out our three unit enchantments, and this one is probably the weakest of the three, but it's still nice to have. As long as you are using shield units, you may as well pick up Spell Tempered Shields, it means you get a little bit extra spell resistance against magical attacks, and you can pass some of that on to adjacent units as long as they're standing next to you when you enter defense mode. Now, when big spells come out, you're probably not going to want to be clumping up anyway, but you may as well pick up spell-tempered shields if you're going into this tome. Enchantment also gives Summon Copper Golem. Now this is a really fantastic tier 1 polearm unit. As golems go, they start off immune to all status effects, all negative status effects, and all morale changes. Which means these things can be really hard to deal with. The only thing you can do to deal with a Copper Golem is to kill it. You have no other way. Of course, the AI loves killing these things, and they seem to prioritize them down very quickly, so you often end up losing them in auto-resolves. However, if you can keep these things alive, when they reach a high level, they will evolve into the very powerful Iron Golem, a defensive shield unit we'll talk about later. The ability to just summon these into any army and reinforce with a polearm unit to help take down cavalry cannot be overstated. They also have pretty decent defenses as far as tier 1 units go. Lastly, we have a city spell, Awaken Tools, and this is a very, very nice sustained city spell. It gives you plus 20 production and plus 20 draft for a minor cost of negative 10 city stability and a small 6 mana upkeep. That's a pretty solid trade-off. Production and draft especially are important in cities, and draft is hard to come by because normal province improvements can't give it to you. Usually, these bonuses are going to be a lot more significant than anything you might lose from the negative city stability. So, unless you're really desperate for that extra 5 or 6 food you might lose early game, Awakened Tools is something I would always recommend having. Moving on, our first tier tome is the Tome of Artificing. We start out with the hero skill Golem Assistant. This gives you a free, disposable Iron Golem Assistant. They won't do a whole lot in battle, but having a free unit means you can throw them at the enemy to soak up attacks. 
this is always nice to have, and I'd pick it up if I ever had the spare skill points. Your special province improvement, the Golem Mine, is a another pretty good one, continuing our winning streak here. Having the ability to put a mine down in places you otherwise can't means you can build a mint in a city that otherwise wouldn't be able to get one. It means you can take advantage of extra gold from merchant skills. You also get a double dip in the in the uh, production by putting it next to quarries, and you're bound to have lots of quarries, as I've mentioned before. So this is a pretty solid one as well. The Iron Golem is a big, tanky boy. Unlike the Copper Golem, this one is built in a city. It's a very powerful, very tanky shield unit with a huge defense stat and it gives plus three defense and plus three status resistance to adjacent units when it's in defense mode. This can be evolved from the Copper Golem, but often you'll probably just want to build them in cities just to get more of them out more reliably. It has the same immunity to negative statuses and morale that the Copper Golem has, which means this thing can be a real nuisance for your enemy to deal with. You got a couple of unit enchantments, starting with the lesser of the two. Siege magic is pretty nice. It gives plus 10% damage to your supports and battle mages, which is always good, and it lets them speed up sieges. That's right, if you have this enchantment, your battle mages and support units give extra fortification damage when you're besieging a city. I like speeding up sieges because this really helps melt cities down a little bit faster. Artisan Armaments, however, is a truly, truly exceptional unit enchantment. This gives 30% crit chance to all your melee units and your archers. The effectiveness of this cannot be understated. This is huge, and there is an awful lot of synergy you can do with this. If you add in flame burst weapons from the Tome of Devastation, suddenly all your melee units have 50% crit from the beginning. Barbarian heroes can pick up Keen Edge to get another 20% crit. You could get another 10% crit in Animal Kinship. And of course, the Tome of Revelry has Reveler's Triumph, which means you do extra critical damage. You can build a really nasty critical hit build with this, which means that you can tear through enemy armies with little effort. But even without a critical hit build, Artisan Armaments just out of the box is without doubt one of the best unit enchantments in the game. Construct Bolt Repeaters is a siege project, and as siege projects go, this one is very solid. It costs 160 gold and gives plus 4 speed to your siege. It is basically better in every way than Construct Onagers, which costs a lot more money. The Bolt Repeaters, it says, that these units have no cooldown. It says they have they do not have a cooldown, unlike Onagers. However, that is not true. They still have a cooldown, as you can see here. It's just that they don't start on cooldown. Still, as siege units go, they are very good, and they do about double the damage that an Onager does. Artisan Fortifications is a building for your city, giving it plus 20 fortification health and bolt repeaters as towers. I am conflicted about this because this only works in defensive sieges, and despite my hundreds of hours playing this game, I have yet to, to be involved in a defensive siege. They just don't happen very often. Perhaps it's something to do with the AI, perhaps that will change when the AI update comes. But right now, while this is a decent bonus to fortification health, you just won't get much use out of it. Then again, it's cheap, and if you have nothing else to build, and plenty of gold, go ahead. 
The Tome of Artificing is such an absolute beast that it can make our next tome, the Tome of Winds, seem tame in comparison. But it does have a couple of standout features. The hero skill, Avenging Winds, is not one of them. This is a very mediocre hero skill, it gives a chance of pushing back enemies, and it's available for battle magic heroes for some reason. It might be more useful if it was available on melee heroes, but as it goes, I'm not fond of this one. The Zephyr Archer, however, is a very powerful tier 3 archer unit. It is possibly essential if you're going archer heavy, competing with only the tier 3 Glade Runner uh, for a slot in your armies. By virtue of a tier 3, uh, they are tankier than lower tier archers and they do more damage by default, even though they cost a little bit more upkeep. They also have Zephyr Shot, which is a longer range single shot attack with splash damage. Um, the regular bow is 4 range by default and Zephyr Shot is 6. The nice thing about Zephyr Shot is most of the uh, enchantments to uh, ranged attacks affect all ranged attacks, not just base physical ranged attacks. So, the Zephyr Archer's Zephyr Shot actually gets increased range with things like Seeker Arrows and Awakened Seeking Missiles, which means this thing can get ridiculous range on it, and you can pepper the enemy army before they even get close. Overall, the Zephyr Archer is a fantastic unit. You also get to summon the Wind Rager, which is a strange Tier 2 elemental. Most of them are Tier 1 or Tier 3, but this one is Tier 2 and does not evolve. As far as elementals go, it's fine. It does reasonable damage. It's not particularly good at anything, but it is very fast, which means it can get into your enemies. At the Whirlwind ability that it has, which only requires one action point, is sometimes quite useful. It throws enemies around whenever you use it, which can be useful for moving enemies out of position or very often getting them off your own units to avoid retaliation attacks. Abducting Cyclone is a great spell and one of the standouts from the Tome of Winds. For 15 mana, this spell is worded quite confusingly, but effectively it is a pull. You target a tile near an enemy, it has to be within three tiles of an enemy, and it pulls the closest enemy to that tile. This is really good for singling out dangerous enemies, pulling them towards your army and killing them. It's also really good for pulling enemies away from any of your ranged units if they have them pinned. That way you can avoid dangerous retaliation attacks for moving away. Overall, Abducting Cyclone is a really great spell for the versatility it allows in the battlefield and its cheap cost. Don't overlook this. Your other spell here, Dust Storm, is less fantastic. In theory, it seems nice. It only costs 15 mana, which is pretty cheap, and Blind is a nice status effect lower accuracy on ranged attacks, and you can't perform retaliation attacks. The only problem with it is this only has a 90% chance of making something blind, which 90% obviously seems pretty high, but as units get more dangerous, as they get to higher tiers, higher tier units have more status resistance, so the chance of them going blind is lower. Plus, what you're really looking at with this spell is a chance to give your enemies a chance to lower their damage. And with Graze being a thing in Age of Wonders 4, that's all this spell will do. It will possibly somewhat lower the enemy's damage. So it's not really reliable, unfortunately. Windborn Scouts is a unit enchantment and very rare for a unit enchantment, it affects scouts, giving your scouts flying mounts. This is... okay. It does have its uses. It means your scouts can fly over mountains, uh, which can make them very hard to catch. 
It makes them move very quickly around the world because they get lower movement cost in all terrain. And it makes them really good for pillaging enemy provinces if you want to annoy your enemy during a war. It can also potentially, because of their fast movement, help your army catch up uh, and pull enemies into combat if they're trying to run away. But at the end of the day, it's a buff to scouts, and as far as uses of your unit enchantments go, that's not fantastic. Favorable Winds is a world spell, and this one is very niche. You target an army on the water, and they regain all their movement points once per turn. This is so niche. If you come up with a situation where you can catch up with an enemy on the water, it becomes great. Or you could use it to rush a whole army across the sea very quickly if you have enough mana and casting points. That would be great. In those situations, favorable winds is fantastic. The problem is that those situations are few and far between, so you will not get a huge amount of use out of this. So, Tome of the Winds as a whole has a couple of real standout points. The Zephyr Archer and Abducting Cyclone are great. The rest of it, you can take it or leave it. It can be fairly weak. Moving on to our Tier 3 tomes, the first of which is the Tome of Transmutation. This is a really interesting tome. You start off, let's have a look at the hero skill and unit enchantment, Adaptive Armor. Once per turn, whenever enchanted units sustain non-physical damage, they gain bolstered resistance, increasing their resistance to magical damage. And status resistance. Two status resistance. This is a pretty nice enchantment to have. It's not game-changing by any means, especially because it can only happen once per turn. If this could happen more than once per turn, this would be bonkers busted. But since it only happens once per turn, it's just a nice bonus to have. One bolstered resistance isn't huge. Eventually, over a couple of turns, this can stack up, but battles don't tend to last more than a couple of turns anyway. Nice to have if you're going into this tome, but nothing, nothing to write home about. Heroes get it as well. Steel Skin is a minor race transformation, which gives your whole race two defense, two blight resistance, and negative two lightning resistance. Two defense is a pretty big buff. Two defense is great, especially depending on who you're up against. If you're up against nature, or if you're up against a very heavily physical army, you're going to be winning with this. You probably don't want to be casting this if all of the enemies on the map are Mystic Culture, who use a lot of battle mages and a lot of lightning damage. That being said, it's a race transformation, so you can't easily cancel it at all. So just be, be aware of who you're up against before you start casting this. You get access to a Transmuter, which is a very interesting unit. The Transmuter is kind of a battle mage for people who don't want to specialize into battle mages, but instead want to do physical damage. Yeah, the Transmuter does physical damage, which is very weird for a battle mage. It means it hits enemy defense instead of enemy resistance. It's also not a very damaging attack as far as battle mages go. But that's not really why you take the Transmuter. The Transmuter is there to support your melee units. Shift Bolts, the Transmuter's main attack, sunders the armor of the enemy, giving them sundered defense, while granting bolstered defense to a random ally within two hexes. That's two hexes of the target, not two hexes of the Transmuter, which means it benefits your melee units. Use the Transmuter to soften them up so your melee units get more tanky and do more damage. Petrify is the real selling point of the Transmuter. This is a full action, long range AoE stun, and it is devastating. 
if you can lower enemy status resistance with a spell before using this, you can stun a whole group of enemies very easily. This is so powerful, it can turn the tide of a battle. So even though the Transmuter itself isn't going to be winning any awards for doing massive damage, Petrify is game-changing. You have a great spell in the form of Melt Armor. This costs 45 mana, which shouldn't be too hard to get by the time you get into tier 3, does 20 fire damage, and gains 3 Sundered Resistance in a 1 Hex Radius. This is a guaranteed Sundered Defense, unless the enemy is completely immune to it, so you will be softening, softening them up, lowering their defense to melee attacks and physical ranged attacks, and lowering their status resistance, which again you could combine with the transmuter to petrify everything. This is a fantastic spell. Sometimes you can come up against enemies with ludicrous amounts of defense, uh, and this really helps a physical faction chew through those. Transmute Resources is a very interesting sustained city spell. It says, target-friendly city converts their mana income gaining gold, production, and food equal to 75% of their mana income. What it doesn't really explain is it is not split between these. Instead, 75% of your mana income goes to food, 75% goes to production, 75% goes to gold, and 75% goes to draft. It doesn't say it boosts draft, but it does. This can really help cities grow phenomenally well. It can also be fantastic to have if you just really need a city to pump out loads of units. If you have loads of mana in reserve, you can get extra gold, extra production, extra draft, use that extra gold to make more units in your city. It's a fantastic sustained city spell. Bear in mind, you do need high mana income for it to be useful in the first place, and if you're building lots of mana income, it's probably because you need it. But if you have a huge amount in reserve, throw on transmute resources and rake in the cash for a while. Moving on, our next tier 3 tome is the Tome of Terramancy, and boy do I love the Tome of Terramancy. This is such a fun tome. Let's start by looking at the hero skill, Leaden Blows. Melee attacks get 2 physical damage and a 90% chance of inflicting Immobilized. I love Immobilized, it's a great status effect, it means you can stop a unit from running away, and it especially means you can hold it in place so your archers or battle mages can pepper it down from range. Using that though, this is not great on a melee hero, because you don't really want to throw your melee heroes at the enemy to try and pin them in place. They're not expendable. What is expendable is the Summoned Stone Spirit. This is the evolved version of the one from the Tome of Rock, and this is a lot better than its younger cousin. It's got a couple of really fantastic abilities here. It's got one real job. Its job is to teleport in and immobilize the enemies. And for that, it's got Immobilizing Phase, which lets it teleport in, it damages enemies and gives a chance to immobilize them. It's not a huge chance, but it hits them in a 1 hex radius around it. It also then has access to Quake, which is a 1 action skill. It gets 1 action left over from using its teleport. Quake hits everything in a 2 hex radius around it and gives another chance to immobilize, this time in a much bigger area. So you can already see, this guy's real job is to be an expendable unit, you can just summon it in, teleport it into the enemy army, immobilize as much as you can, tank a bit of damage and probably die, but it, who cares, it's a summon, just summon another. It gets in, it stops your enemies from moving, and it lets your archers fire away at range to take the enemy down, without them being able to fight back. 
It is a great unit, especially if you use it properly. You've got another few options for doing the very similar things to that, and Seismic Shock is one of them. This is a reasonable amount of physical damage. Again, physical damage is not the best in a spell, but it deals damage in a one hex radius and inflicts slowed. And slowed I also really love for the same reason I love immobilized. It stops melee units from getting to your archers or your battle mages. Most normal units have the ability to move four tiles. This reduces it to three, which is a nice little reduction. Fast units, if you put slow on them, fast units like cavalry can usually move five or six tiles. If you put slow on them, they can still only move three tiles. This can totally stop dangerous enemies from engaging you, and this is a guaranteed slow if the enemy is not immune. Again, this is fantastic for stopping the enemy from getting to your archers while you shoot them from range. It only costs 45 mana. Great value from this one. Crushing Earth is a really interesting spell. It says you have a 60% chance of instantly killing a tier 3 unit or lower. If the unit resists, it is stunned and sustains 40 physical damage instead. This one, you've got to look at it at one way. It is a guaranteed stun. Even if the unit doesn't die, which it might, it might not, it is a guaranteed stun and some heavy damage on it. It means it's really great when you get it. It will start to fall off later in the game when more tier 4s and tier 5s start to come into play because you can't just get rid of the most dangerous enemy then. But lots of really powerful cavalry for instance are tier 3s and lots of powerful supports are tier 3s. Being able to just stop them in their tracks with a stun and possibly kill them is great. Tremor Ritual is a siege project, and as siege projects go, this one is fantastic. It costs 100 gold and 100 mana, but it speeds up the siege by 6. That is fantastic. Not only that, but it destroys all towers, all battlements, and any additional wall obstacles. Which means, not only does this speed up your sieges, it also does the job of multiple other siege projects, saving you siege project slots for more interesting siege projects, like, for example, summon the warhounds, or even just harass defenders so your enemy takes more damage. Great little siege project. Lastly, you have Earth Shatter, and this is one of the real selling points of this tome. Earth Shatter destroys mountains. You can add the rocky feature to any province, which is nice if you wanted to add more quarries in, and we've already talked about how good quarries can be, but being able to destroy mountains is phenomenal. This means you can cross otherwise mountainous terrain. You can get to your enemy's soft underbelly. You can use it for surprise attacks. Not that you can really surprise the AI since they know where everything is already, but you can cross terrain that would normally you'd normally have to go around for several turns. Nope, just blow up the mountains. It is fantastic. You could also use it to make more room for your cities to grow if they're running out of places to expand to. If your enemy parks their city in the middle of the mountains, so it's difficult to get to. Nope, Earth Shatter, just tear it all down. It's a fun, fun spell. It also does a little bit of damage, but it's 10 physical damage, so who cares? Moving on to tier 4, our first tier 4 tome is the Tome of the Golden Realm, and this tome is all about money. We've got to have money. If you ever find yourself in need of gold, this is the best way of getting more of it. It's got some really powerful abilities. The hero skill, Gilded Magic, says it makes critical hits with magic attacks inflict Gilded. This status effect is everywhere in the tome. Gilded is basically a stun 
with a little bit of extra gold if you manage to kill it. This gold can very quickly add up if you manage to get it on high tier units. You can get 100 gold for a tier 5. Gilded magic itself is absolutely fantastic with anything that boosts your hero's chance to critical hit. And because this says it affects magic attacks, this doesn't just mean the base magic attack of your hero. This includes things like the big AoEs you can get, such as fire evocation and frost fire detonation. Frost fire detonation hits a 2 hex radius around the target. If you can crit with this, you can effectively stun all the enemies in a 2 hex radius. And this stun is not a chance to stun, this is a guaranteed stun. This is ridiculous if you combine it with many of the other ways you can get critical hits on your heroes. For example, max maximized magic from the Tome of the Archmage currently gives plus 40% crit chance on magical attacks. If you stack crits, this can just turn the entire enemy army to gold very easily. You also get access to a special province improvement, the Bazaar of Wonders. This counts as a mine, it gives plus 10 gold and plus 5 for unique adjacent province improvements. That's nice, you can put it in a place where you otherwise wouldn't be able to get any adjacency bonuses because things don't match up. Maybe you've got it next to a farm and a quarry and a conduit. So. struggling. You get access to a special province improvement, the Bazaar of Wonders. This counts as a mine, gives a little bit of gold and a bit more for unique adjacent province improvements. This one's nice, it isn't really anything special, you can throw it in a place where you otherwise wouldn't be able to get any adjacency bonuses and really get a little bit of extra money off that. And we always need more money. You get access to a great spell in the form of Gilding Blast. This is a 1 hex radius and a 90% chance of becoming gilded for one turn, which of course is a stun. This is a little bit expensive to cast, it does cost a hundred mana, but a stun is a stun, and stuns are great. You can also potentially combine this with the Golden Golem. Now this guy is a tier 5 mythic unit with a polearm, though because he is a mythic unit, bear in mind he will not gain the benefits of any enchantments that polearm units get. Nevertheless, this guy is truly, truly terrifying. He is a really, really scary polearm unit. His base attack, Gilding Strike, has a 60% chance of inflicting Gilded, so he can stun enemies he hits and turn them into more money. He also can Gild enemies that attack him, and if he goes into defense mode, he has unlimited retaliation attacks. This thing is frightening. Its defenses are a little bit on the lower side compared to, say, the Iron Golem, but again, he gets the same benefits those golems do, which are immunity to negative status effects as well as immunity to morale. He is pretty tanky, but he has very high upkeep, and he also has a very powerful, full action ability, Strike Gold. Deals damage to all gilded units within a three hex radius around him. If any are killed, he heals some temporary hit points. This is a pretty high damage attack, and if you combine it with any of the other ways to inflict gilded, such as Gilding Blast, or maybe a big AoE Frostfire Detonation with Gilded Magic, you can kill a lot of enemy units with this guy. Gold Touched is a minor race transformation, and as far as these go, this one is pretty solid. It has plus two resistance, which is a nice 
little upside. No army is going to turn up its nose at plus two resistance. You've already, in Materium Tomes, had ways to boost your defense. Now boost your resistance against magical attacks. Plus, you also get plus one gold per population in your cities. By the time you get to a tier four tome, you might have 60 population in your cities or something like that. So it's not an enormous amount of gold, but it certainly adds up and helps you pay for some of the tier 5 units that you're bound to be recruiting. You also have access to a couple of city buildings. The reagent refinery gives plus 20 gold for each magic material in the city's domain. That's a pretty big chunk of gold. Uh, usually a city will definitely want to have at least one or two magic materials, so you're probably looking at 40 or 60 gold from this, which means it will pay for itself very quickly. Your other building is even more interesting, Luxury Markets. By this point you might be thinking, well I've got all this gold, what do I do with it? Luxury Markets is the answer. This says, buy now is 25% cheaper and can be used two times per world map turn. What this means is that you can hurry production in your city twice. It also means you can hurry production, uh, hurry recruitment of units twice. This is truly fantastic. It lets you build up cities very, very quickly, which means more of every resource, food, production, knowledge, mana, etc. It lets you build up bigger armies, because you can just hurry recruitment. So this is your answer for spending all that gold you earn. Our second tier 4 tome is the Tome of the Crucible, and one of the key features here is Meteor Arrows and Meteor Strikes. So Meteor Arrows is a unit enchantment which makes physical ranged attacks of your archers primarily deal plus 5 fire damage to the target and adjacent units. First of all, plus 5 fire damage on its own is pretty powerful for a ranged enchantment. Even if it didn't do splash damage, this would still be worth taking. But the fact that it deals splash damage to adjacent units is also fantastic if the enemy is clumped up. Be aware the AoE from Meteor Arrows does not spread status effects, so if your archers inflict weakened like Dark Culture's Pursuers, or you have them enchanted to do poisoned or anything like that, the splash damage does not spread those status effects. However, this is still a really great buff to your archers, and the fact that it gains Demolisher means any cover or anything around them is also going to be destroyed by your archer's attacks. The Meteor Strikes hero skill is frankly a lot weaker. I mean, plus three fire damage, again, is nice, and this affects melee and ranged heroes, but it's weaker than the Meteor Arrows enchant, which is really disappointing. I also tend to prefer shock heroes because they can hit with one big heavy damage attack that cancels defense mode and retaliation and if you have a shock hero well this is only adding a measly three fire damage to their attack so unless you're using a hero with repeating attacks this is often not worth taking your special province improvement is the Great Foundry. This is another mine, plus 10 gold and plus 5 draft and 3 extra gold for adjacency bonuses with other mines. This is fine, uh, you probably won't have a great deal of mines, um, and they will often be placed wherever you have gold veins, so you won't expect to be getting significant adjacency bonuses from this, I'm afraid. One of the real standout features of this tome is the spell Lava Burst. This one costs 100 mana to cast, and it does 30 fire damage in a 2 hex radius. 
It, do it inflicts burning on all enemies in the radius, it slows them down, and it sets the ground on fire. This spell has actually been nerfed. It used to do 40 fire damage, which made it even more powerful. Certainly one of the most powerful spells in the game. But this is still a fantastic spell for all its extra effects. Burning means they're going to be taking damage over time. Slowed means they're going to be approaching your army very slowly. Meanwhile, you pepper them with meteor arrows dealing even more splash damage and just wiping out entire stacks of enemies. This is a nasty, nasty spell. Your other spell, however, Meteor Shower, is pretty terrible. This one costs 200 mana to cast and is just a bad, bad spell. It says here, two meteors impact next to random enemies when you cast this as well as at the start of your turns. They don't impact the enemies they target, they impact next to the enemies. Which can sometimes be on top of your own units if you have units in melee range. Overall, this spell is just terrible. It's random and it can hurt your own units. I don't see any reason to cast this when you have access to the much better Lava Burst. So unfortunately, while Meteor Shower is really fun, it looks cool, it just, it's not reliable, unfortunately. Pyroclastic Eruption is a fantastic terraforming world spell. What this does is you target an enemy province and it destroys the province improvement. This is fantastic for denying your enemy a magical victory. As long as you can block any spell jammers they have by putting a unit on top of the spell jammer, you can just cast this spell and wipe out the province. It also transforms it into desolate terrain, which most most factions walk very slowly on, and enemies in the province take fire damage. 15 of it, which is pretty decent for a terraforming spell. You can use this to soften your enemy up before a big battle. Just make sure you can still get to the enemy after the terrain is terraformed into desolate, because it takes longer to move over desolate terrain. That being said, the main use is just wiping out your enemy's province improvements, and it's always valuable to have a spell like this. Lastly, we have the Fortified Crucible, which is a city structure, which adds a few extra bonuses to any battlements you might have in a city, and gives a massive plus 40 siege defense. This thing is cheap as well, it only costs 170 gold. But again, this is a siege defense building, and so rarely do I ever find myself on the receiving end of sieges. And even if you were on the receiving end of a siege, your enemy can simply use a siege project to break your battlements, which means you lose these benefits. They still have to take a little extra to chew through your cities, and this thing is cheap, so I suppose it, it would be fine. It's probably more valuable in multiplayer than it is against the AI. Last, and certainly not least, we have the Tier 5 Tome, the Tome of the Creator. This is a really fun tome, and it starts with the hero skill Ancient of Earth. This is a high tier warfare skill, and this one is just fun. This makes your hero grow in size to the point that they tower over cities on the world map. It makes them large targets, so they are easier to hit, but they do get charge resistance, and they cannot be displaced by most effects. It gives them plus 20 hit points, which is quite a lot, and plus 30% damage. This makes your heroes into absolute beasts. It is hilarious watching shock heroes just run in with a huge axe and one-shot everything. Another big downside is that they can't use a mount, but 
you're still probably going to want to take this because plus 30% damage and plus 20 hit points is huge. You have a great spell in the form of Tectonic Shatter. This is a damage spell. All enemies suffer 30 physical damage. 30 physical damage is not a lot, but this affects all enemies on the map, which could be 18 or more if the enemy has summons. And it gives them all a 60% chance of being stunned, and it destroys obstacles on the map. This does cost 200 mana, so it's very expensive, and the damage, especially in the late game, is very low. But being able to have a chance to just stun the enemy army is phenomenal. This is hugely disruptive. It's not the best source of stuns in the game, but since it can affect every enemy unit on the map, it is great. You can start casting it early on to destroy obstacles and disrupt your enemy's plans, or you can cast it right before you engage with the enemy to have a chance to stun them, taking away retaliation attacks and making them more vulnerable. It is a very powerful spell. Speaking of very powerful spells, Call the Titan of the Earth is a combat summon, and it is a fun combat summon at that. This is a big, beefy boy with heavy charge strike. You can summon him right behind your enemy's archers and just have him slam them. You could also put him in the middle of melee units to because summoning him cancels defense modes and retaliation, and then he can cancel more with his charge strike. He's got a lot of health, decent defenses, and if he manages to stay alive for even a single turn, he can use his full action to immobilize enemies in a similar way to summoned uh, stone spirits. Only he is a lot more reliable at it, with a 90% chance of immobilizing. Again, you can summon this in your enemy's backline, immobilize everything, and let your archers clean everything up. Create Earth Shatter Engines is a fantastic little siege project. This is absolutely free. It costs no gold and no mana, and it speeds up the siege by 10 that's massive. That means you can burn down your enemy cities very quickly, and at the stage of the game where you get a tier 5 tome, you're probably going to be involved in lots of wars, and you're going to be wanting to tear down all your enemy cities, which can be very heavily fortified at this point. So 10 siege speed is great. This also gives you two Earth Shatter Engine units. Now these things aren't fantastic, they are very slow moving, but they can essentially freely cancel defense modes, cancel retaliation attacks, and slow your enemies. However, because they are siegecraft units, if you use multiple siegecraft unit siege projects, you'll get whichever one the game considers strongest. So, for example, I really like combining this with... Um, the Devastator Sphere Siege Project, because that one gives plus 8 to your siege speed, and it prioritizes the Devastator Spheres over the Earth Shatter Engines. So don't necessarily expect to actually see these units in the game, depending on the siege project you use. Still, it's free, and it's a huge amount of siege speed. You can't go wrong with this. Lastly, we have a unit enchantment. This one affects all your elementals. So, your conjured elementals, such as your stone spirits, storm spirits, etc., as well as all your golems, copper golem, iron golem, golden golem, even the titan of the earth is affected by this. So, all enchanted units get undying which means they return back to life with half their hit points after two turns. It only works once per battle, but this is a huge bonus. It's a real shame it only works after two turns, but one of the key advantages of this is that it is an enchantment, not a spell. 
Many of the other Tier 5 tomes, such as the Tome of the God Emperor or the Tome of the Goddess of Nature, have big revive spells they can use to bring their units back to life. But that's no use if you're in combat with a spell jammer, or if there's a mage bane in combat. You simply can't use those spells. But because this is a unit enchantment, it doesn't matter what is happening, your elementals are coming back to life. Truly, truly fantastic. You can make big armies of summoned elementals, throw them at your enemy, watch them all die and get back up again, and see your enemies despair as they crumble before you. The Tome of the Creator is probably not the most powerful Tier 5 Tome. As far as Tier 5 Tomes go, I think this one is pretty weak, but I think it's really fun. You get a couple of really interesting spells which can be very powerful in combat, you get a way to speed up your sieges, and you really power up your elementals and any shock heroes you may have. So overall, Lots of fun to be had. The Materium Tomes, some of them are, they're a real mixed bag. Some of them are very powerful, some of them not so much. But on the whole, I think they're a lot of fun. And I hope this video has helped give you a few details that you might use in your game, giving you some synergies to think about. If you did like this video, please consider giving me a like and a subscribe, and I'll see you again in the next one. Take care.